Hey, this is Dominic, and this is your home for the cutting edge conversations on optimizing your personal performance, lighting up your sex life, and living a purpose driven life of your own design. These are the topics that Dominic and I have both struggled with in our own lives and still don't always get right. This is Brian. Welcome to the Great Man Podcast. If you guys have been following the episodes that we've dropped over these last few weeks, then you know I was recently in the jungles of Costa Rica with a group of Special Forces military vets to work with ayahuasca, the psychedelic plant medicine, in an effort for these combat vets to confront and heal the PTSD that they experienced in combat. Now, one of the men I immediately connected with on this journey was Brandon Mills. Brandon was a Marine Recon Scout sniper who's now turned musician And he has spent a number of years on the inner work journey after coming to grips with his own PTSD that he walked around with for many years of his life undiagnosed. I knew I needed to bring Brandon on this podcast because his story is one of taking his greatest pain and not only turning it into one of his greatest teachers, but also a source of his greatest creation, which is the music that he now puts into this world. And to help me dig into this story, we have a special guest appearance from your boy, Keith Bracci, who was also with me on that Costa Rica trip, and he'll be standing in for Brian today. Here's a little more about Brandon Mills. Brandon has lived his life as a warrior, a poet, a servant, and an artist. Like I mentioned before, he served in the Marine Corps as a recon Marine. Recon is short for reconnaissance, and this is an elite group of men who do their work at night clandestine, unseen by the enemy. He was a scout sniper with tours to both Iraq and Afghanistan, and he endured hellish training to become a recon Marine, sleep deprivation, food deprivation, inhumane living conditions, all as part of his preparation for the horrors of war. Now, after leaving the Marines, Brandon began questioning the systemic issues that control many of the world's citizens. So he spent the next few years serving in orphanages and refugee camps around the globe with a desire to give and learn the deep issues of humanity's broken heart. He also spent years in his 20s walking around with PTSD without even knowing it, living in his own personal hell. And it was only when he turned to inner work was he able to begin his healing journey and start the next chapter of his life as a musician. So in this episode, you're going to hear what it's like to live with PTSD for years without even knowing it, And Brandon will talk about how to identify the symptoms because even if you're not struggling with or dealing with PTSD from a traumatic event or having been to war, you are likely walking around with pain, chronic pain, something that's unresolved. And to hear him talk about the ways in which he medicated and how he couldn't sit still will have a serious application for what you're probably navigating in your life. Brandon also talks about how being tough and being vulnerable are not mutually exclusive traits. He starts to share some of the conditions that he endured that are required to train and create an elite fighter. He also shares why you need to pursue what's uncomfortable if you're looking to build courage and strength. Brandon talks about how pain and love can be two of your greatest teachers in life and why being an artist for him is actually an even more challenging path than being a Marine recon. And finally, when your life suffering, the suffering that you've endured in life has meaning, it can be one of the greatest growth catalysts in your life. And finally, we have a first on the show. Stick around to the very end and we'll roll into the full length version of Brandon's most popular song on Spotify, a song called Don't Mistake, which is a song that he wrote in the aftermath of transitioning from combat vet to active civilian when he wanted to remind himself and others that love casts out fear. Get ready for a powerful discussion on turning your pain and PTSD into your greatest creations featuring Brandon Mills. All right, fellas, we got a special conversation today. So not only do we have Keith Bracci back by popular demand, But we've got, so half of our listeners on this show, even though this is a podcast for men called The Great Man Within, half of our listeners are women. 
And this is going to be an especially exciting episode for our female listeners because we've got Brandon Mills, singer, songwriter, military veteran, and just a handsome, handsome devil. Welcome <laughs> to the show, buddy. Great seeing you again, man. Bro, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity to hang out with you guys. I love you both so much. Yeah, man. How come I didn't get any handsome in my intro? What was up with that? <laughs> well, I mean, you know. <laughs> We speak, we speak truth on this oh, podcast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's so cool to get this group back together because we had a chance to meet, what, two and a half, three weeks ago now in Costa Rica? Yep. And we became instant best friends. I think we did. It was kind of a quick journey to becoming best it's friends. A bromance. Big bromance. It's a bromance. And I figured before we got into some of the, the more, I don't know, you call it like deeper stuff, because we're going to unpack some PTSD. We're going to talk about inner work journeys, personal development. I figured we'd ease into it because you seem like a guy who likes a little bit of foreplay, Brandon. Um, (laughs) You know me well, brother. You know me well. Yeah. I'm picking up what you're putting down, man. And I thought we'd play a little game of this or that so our audience can get to know you. So these are just quick hit. Do you like this or do you like that? Okay. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Correct. Uh, smooth (laughs) (laughs) Smooth or chunky peanut butter? I gotta go chunky, man. I need that texture. Two for two. Morning person, night owl. I'm kind of both. If I gotta pick one, I probably flourish more at night. Okay. Jocko Willink or David Goggins? Ooh. I'm going Goggins on that. Okay. Now we clearly know that the Marines are the number one, but if you had to pick a number two, Army, Navy, Air Force. I gotta go Army, but it's gotta be SF dudes. You got to go army, but it has to be special forces guys? Yes. Got it. Okay. And then these last two Keith submitted, when it comes to cuddling, inner spoon or outer spoon? <laughs> Depends how big the cuddler is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm usually big spoon, but sometimes when the hair gets trapped in my face, it's it, yeah, I, I slip. I flip the script. So. Got it. And the last one, and again, this was Keith submitted this one. <laughs> When it's time for intimacy, are you an eyes open or an eyes closed kind of guy? Eyes open all night long and deep into the morning. Nice. Yeah, for sure. Keith approves. Those are the answers I was hoping for. <laughs> oh, you got him, brother. <laughs> so we learned a lot about you in that in the, in that short little game of this or that. And and so why don't we dig a little bit deeper? You know, Brandon, your website has this really cool three, three and a half minute video that provides this really cool story arc that we'd like to unpack in the conversation today. And at age 19, you entered the military and you went through the Marines. So can you talk about how you found the military as a calling in your life and why did you pick the Marines specifically? I spent a lot of time figuring this out after I got out of the Marine Corps. Like, why did I do this? Because I wasn't actually sure. But looking at my life at the time, it kind of made sense. So grew up with a poverty mindset, didn't believe I had the money or the intellect or the discipline to start college at a young age. And I'm very much okay with that. I didn't want to start my life out in debt. Um, I knew the military would pay for schooling after that. I knew I needed a solid ass whooping. Between the time of like 14 to 18, I was an idiot. I was uh, running around smoking weed. I was chasing girls. I was not, I didn't have a focus. I didn't have a clear intention in my life. And I was like, you know what? I think the discipline that the military is going to offer is going to shock my system into becoming the man that I really want to be. And then finally, I really, I really wanted to serve. The way that I viewed it at the time, I believed that we were liberating an oppressed people group. And so I was like, I'm all about that. I want to serve. I want to instill justice where people don't have the strength to fight for their own justice. And uh, that's kind of been a theme in my life, my whole life, uh, even to this day, is like to serve service to others. So Brandon, you know, we hear a lot about special forces and, you know, I think the thing, the names that come to mind for a lot of people are, you hear a lot about Navy SEALs, we hear a lot about Army Rangers, but Marine reconnaissance is not something that gets its fair due. So can you explain a little bit about the training that you go through, some of the trials and tribulations that you've been, that you faced and what that did for you in that getting your ass whooped and that discipline that you're talking about? So I joined the Marine Corps, 19 years old. I go through um, boot camp. I volunteer to be a squad leader. So that takes harsh punishment because you're responsible for everything your squad does or fails to do. And then I got meritoriously promoted to that. Then I go to a regular infantry unit and I excel in that. I get promoted. I'm a team leader at a young age. I'm the guide, which is kind of like the representative of the company of a few hundred people. Go to Afghanistan, 
get some accolades in combat and then get meritoriously promoted to corporal. And I still just wasn't really satisfied. And I was like, there's got to be more. And so my brother, my older brother, who I actually went to boot camp with, crazy ass story, he also squad leader, he got plucked right after boot camp to go to reconnaissance. I, on the other hand, didn't. So I went through the regular infantry unit. The whole time we're talking, he's like, brother, you got to come over here. It's the right community. Everyone I've talked to that's been in the regular infantry loves it over here at Recon. And so I went from this place of stability almost in my first unit where I was a squad leader. I was kind of the poster child of the of the company. I was going to go to squad leaders course. I was going to go back and lead a squad into Iraq. And I was like, I need to go continue to get humbled. I need to continue to get challenged in a way that that is uncomfortable. And I guess I've pursued that my whole life. So took the plunge and, and signed up for reconnaissance training. There's pre-BRC and then there's BRC. BRC stands for Basic Reconnaissance Course. Um, and it's a myriad of everything that you need to be to be a functioning basic reconnaissance Marine. Reconnaissance goes out underneath the guise of night. Uh, we're clandestine. We're never seen. We're never heard of. And so there's a lot of discipline that's required to be able to do that. We usually operate in six-man teams, but because of Iraq and the five-man Humvee element, we were operating in five-man teams. And you just go through the ringer, man. It's sleep deprivation, food deprivation. It's long nights up, writing patrol orders. It's an immense amount of minuscule tasks that creates a discipline that you can't have any other way. And it really weeds out those who don't have the self-discipline to grind it out day in and day out. It creates an elite, an elite fighter and creates a discipline that can't, I don't think I could discover any other way. It's amazing to be accountable for your brothers to the left and your right. You kind of survive and hang on and hold strong for them. And so, and then you go through this monumental suck fest <laughs> and you come out the other end, really, really proud of what you've done, but also trusting everybody that you've gone through that training with. So yeah, that's a long answer. Then I went to scout sniper after that, which was just another solid kick in the nuts, 13 weeks of hell. And yeah, I just, my whole life, or at least my whole Marine Corps career, not really my whole life, I've been pursuing what's uncomfortable to create a strength and a courage that I don't think can exist any other way. If it does, please let me know. I haven't found it yet. <laughs> <laughs> what about psychedelics? <laughs> yeah, dude, I, it's funny that you say that because I say, you know, we used to be, I, when I talked to veterans, I was like, we used to be on the front lines of battle. And now I want to be on the front lines of human consciousness. And I think so much of that has to do with psychedelic. And I'm all about it, bro. And it's, yes, it's a kick in the spiritual nutsack. <laughs> <laughs> you know, now that you mentioned that though, like even when I first met you, like seeing the contrast between here's this like experienced Marine, but, you know, speaking to you, like you seem so sensitive, you're a musician, you know, you're very, you know, artistic and not that like hardened military guy that you, you know, is stereotypical. So being as sensitive and open-minded, you know, how did that experience in military? Was that an advantage or was it like, did it make it harder? I think it was a lot more challenging for me. So I was hyper-religious when I was in the Marine Corps, hardcore Christian to a fault, you know, very judgmental, very standoffish because I, I didn't have the maturity to like accept and love and, and understand different People have different human experiences and neither one is right or wrong. Maybe some might be healthier than others. So I had a lot of judgment. Uh, so that created a standoffish. And then, yeah, I was a sensitive dude. You learn in the military to put that on the back, on the back burner. And so I kind of had to rediscover that when I got out. The reason I waited until I was in my mid twenties to pursue music as a professional art was because I was scared to death to be vulnerable. And there was this toxic masculinity in my mind that said vulnerability is weakness. And they teach that in the Marine Corps and probably the rest of the military. And as I got older and the men that I really valued, I was like, dude, they're vulnerable as shit. They talk about their emotions. They talk about their weaknesses. They talk about the things that they're working on. And I'm like, that is strength. That takes balls. You can pretend to be this perfect person on the outside world, but everybody's dealing with their shit. The moment you can acknowledge it, you can speak freely about it. You can put it in its place and you can encourage other people to do that. That's true masculinity. That's true vulnerability. That's true strength. You know, So that took a long time. I'm still kind of working that out. There's times when like, I was a little nervous to play in front of you guys, like play some love ballads because there's a bunch of alpha male, you know, combat veterans. And so I just got to check in with that voice. I'm like, bro, that's such bullshit because the reality is every time I go out on a limb and I'm vulnerable, 
the men in my life who are truly masculine, truly alpha and true warriors, they all go, bro, that's beautiful. You know? Yeah. So that was a long time coming, but I'm glad to be here on this side of it. Yeah, man. I mean, one, one of the special moments from the Costa Rica trip was when we all sat down. I think it was like second or third night, the night before we were finishing, I think. And we sat around the campfire, you sang, and it brought us all together. It was just this moment of community. And and you're right. Like some of your songs are very heart-centered and they're very vulnerable. And I wondered what that experience was like for you sitting around some of these Marine recons and Navy SEALs and Army Rangers and some of these are like the toughest dudes you'll ever meet and books are written about these guys. And and it was a beautiful moment that everyone had a chance to experience. I do want to come back to the vulnerability conversation a little bit later on, but I think there's still more to unpack here about your story around the suffering that you went through during your training and what that built inside of you, because eventually it does lead to uh, some of the experiences you had in battle and then the PTSD that you experienced afterwards. So Roger Sparks, who is one of the men who highly decorated, who came down to this Costa Rica trip too. I'm reading his book, The Warrior's Creed. And, you know, he was a trainer or I don't know how to have the right term, but he ended up putting people through recon training at some point. And one of the, the key insights from the book was he had learned from one of his mentors that his job as a trainer was to teach the men how to suffer. And then how to understand their suffering and then how to transcend that. Because in war and battle, the other side is going to be putting you through suffering and they're not going to care about, you know, have you eaten? Have you slept? You know, like what, what are the conditions? Do your feet hurt? And so can you talk about maybe some of the benefits that you experienced from going beyond like way beyond human suffering and then maybe some of the, the dark side of that? That carried forward after it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, man. Well, this is what I always tell people. I say love and pain have been my two greatest teachers. So there's something about putting yourself in a situation that you're uncomfortable with. And I love humanity, but we're way too comfortable. Well, most of us sit around in 68 to 72 degree temperature controlled rooms the entire day. And so there's... Um, Soft living makes soft humans. So there's something about the suffering that I'm almost addicted to because it's a check-in with yourself. It's a check-in with what you're capable of. And the beautiful thing is, is you're going to realize when you go through these trials and tribulations, you're so much stronger than you thought you were. You're so much stronger than you thought you were. And and obviously it's easier to do that. Well, usually it's easier to do that with a, a group of men who are also suffering, you know, misery loves company in, in some <laughs> regard. So yeah, so going through that, I think it's a sense of pride. And I, I use that word in a healthy way not an egotistical way. So there's a sense of pride of like going through things that seem impossible to learn how strong you are and to build trust within yourself, to build uh, strength, courage, commitment, discipline. So those things are all like a necessity at this point in my life where if I get too comfortable, I, I get weirded out. I'm like, if I'm home on the couch for more than like a day or two, I'm like, dude, you're losing it, bro. You're getting weak. So that's been a muscle. I guess I've learned to flex and learn to like strengthen my whole life. It does come at a cost though, because sometimes there's this inability to appreciate how all the strides that you're making. So for my example, reconnaissance Marine, it meritoriously promoted to every rank except Sergeant, first in my class to get promoted to NCO, Scout Sniper, reconnaissance Marine. I was never satisfied. So there was something broken in me that goes, dude, you're doing some cool shit, but it was always like, yeah, but you didn't get honor grad at sniper school. Yeah, but you didn't get a, a you know, a purple heart, a bronze star. So are you really that cool? So there's, there's that balance. And that's probably where the darkness comes in that shadow that says you're not good enough. So comparison being the thief of joy, uh, you're not good enough. You didn't beat this guy, even though you beat a hundred thousand other people jockeying for this position, you didn't beat that one guy. So you're not good enough. So there's a lot of that negative self-talk that I had to let go and had to like come to terms with, with that psychedelics really helped me with. And then there's just like putting yourself through war type situations. You're going to see some ugliness of humanity. You're going to see some darkness. You're going to see some selfishness, some greed, some ego. And those are hard to wrap your head around and really forgive into. But I've, you know, I'm learning more than, more than ever now is like everything that you are judging and everything that you're holding on to is some type of judgment or um, issue you have with yourself. And so they kind of go hand in hand. My inability to forgive those who were ignorant and full of hate and disillusioned that wanted to cause violence 
uh, there was something in me that wanted to cause violence and wanted to kill and wanted to be more justified than the other person that I was fighting. So all of these things are coming to fruition now and took a long time, the acceptance of it all and learning how to love myself and, and even learn, learning how to love my enemy, you know? Yeah. What's coming up for me is like hearing about all the benefits of suffering, you know, and how important that is. And as a father, like I got my two little daughters and the last thing in the world I want them to do is suffer, but it's so important to suffer. And so Mm -hmm. even within my own life, practicing stuff like fasting, you know, uh, cold showers, abstaining from anything that I feel like has a grip on me, going to the gym and suffering, you know, pushing those heavy weights up and And all these kinds of things where you can have these intermittent sufferings so that Mm -hmm. as sufferings happen throughout the day, you know, you're trained for it. You know, it's, it's a really important thing, but still haven't figured out that piece with the kids. Uh, You know, how do you, how do you make them suffer in a way that just all that life pain just brings so much benefit as well. Um, But you fight like hell. So they don't feel that. Yeah, it's just, I'm not a parent yet. Don't know if I will be, but it's this complexity of like loving someone unconditionally and also wanting to protect them. And like, do, I guess it's doing everything that you can to prepare them. Like Roger Sparks said, teach them how to suffer. So when they're going through it, they know that they're capable of, of handling it. And so maybe strengthening that inner strength of uh, validating, bringing that out, that inner strength. I think that's something, something that I love more than anything. One of my favorite words in the world is encourage. It literally means to give someone more courage. And I think about that, my people, the people in my life, the people I love and I, I have in my intimate spaces is like, dude, I want you to be more courageous when you're around me. And so maybe that's an insight for parents out there that like, I'm going to give them the ability to be more courageous. That might come at the cost of some pain and some suffering, but they'll be courageous in that uh, environment and be know that they can flourish in that, or at least learn a lesson that that is invaluable only from that perspective. Brandon, I think many of the men who are listening here can relate to in some point in their lives being a part of a team where they're striving for a common ideal. And in some cases, that ideal may be bigger than them, whether it's like a championship on a team sport or some goal in a professional setting. Perhaps there is no crucible that burns hotter than individuals who are pledging their lives and their allegiance to the military and to the service ideal that is higher than them, risking their lives. And so my question for you, Brandon, is, you know, what is it like to have been part of an experience where you've risked your life for an ideal higher than you? And then what's it also like in creating the bonds with other human beings who also risked their lives and went through many of the same things that you did together. Yeah. Well, man, I, my whole life is full of gratitude and I'm, I'm just so honored to be a part of this journey. And I'm a, I'm so honored to be a part of this elite group of people. It's amazing. You, if I meet another Marine instant respect, instant brotherhood, if I need to meet another recon Marine, you can stay on my couch. I don't even need to know your last name, you know? So there's something to be said about that. That's really powerful. As far as building a team and working beside a team of elite people, like first and foremost, you got to check your fucking ego at the door. That's huge. And that got me in trouble quite a bit. What's best for the collective, not what's best for self. Uh, Self-preservation, I think a lot of times will get you killed or will get you uh, in dissonance with the group as a whole. It keeps you humble. It keeps you hardworking. There's a beautiful accountability. If everybody's bringing their best effort forward, you have to show up for them and for yourself. And the team is only good as the the weakest link. So you never want to be the weakest link. So there's a beautiful accountability uh, that is required to be a part of this elite uh, force, this uh, functional cohesiveness that exists in upper echelon uh, military training. And uh, it really brings about Again, a, a sense of strength, a sense of discipline that I don't think I would have garnered any other way, you know, outside of maybe athletics, if I was a professional athlete or something to that degree. But yeah, it's an honor, man. And I, I, I recommend everyone go try and find something that they can be a part of that requires them to show up harder and deeper than they would normally by themselves, whether it's like joining a, you know, a CrossFit gym or joining a triathlete group, you know, whatever it takes. But uh, I've always said, and I stole this from Gary V, like I'm not as good as being accountable to myself as I am to other people. So I always put myself in a position where I have to be accountable to someone else. Uh, That could be through music. That could be through my discipline, showing up for 
anybody or anything. If I've said I'm going to do something, I'm going to fucking do it. And if I said I, if I made a promise to someone else, I'm going to fucking keep it. You know, to my utmost ability. We should play that as the uh, you know as our advertisement for the Great Man Mastermind because like that's a lot of what I get out of this group is being in a group all in the trenches together. That accountability is big. The second I say it out in public to this group that I I got to do this then I, I can't hide out anymore. I got eyeballs on me. And I, I use the power of that like peer pressure where as a kid, maybe it was not good, but now it exists. It's a human condition and use it to your advantage. You know, so I get that. Yeah. And I love what you said about like what it takes to be part of an elite force. You know what I mean? Like, cause all of a sudden, and you said you don't want to be like the least performer or the lowest performer in that group. You don't want to let anyone down. So at all times, you're running with this group of elites who are constantly raising that standard and therefore like you're never comfortable and you talked about not wanting to be comfortable. So that's really cool insight that I'm taking away. You were in the Marines for four years. Then you leave at probably age 23, 24, right? So you're a super young guy in the video on your website, and I'm going to link your website in the show notes. You talk about how you lived many years with PTSD and you didn't even know it right? Because you you saw battle. You were one of the very few in the forces who had a chance to see actual battle, saw men's lives taken, took you know the enemy's lives. So what's it like to live a life with PTSD without even knowing it? Yeah, that's a great question. Hindsight's twenty twenty, you know, and like, you don't know what you don't know. It wasn't blissfully ignorant. It was miserable. <laughs> I'd be able to talk about this now in hindsight, but at the time I had no idea what was going on, but I was hyper vigilant. So always had my adrenaline cortisol running and dumping into my body. So constantly in a sympathetic uh, nervous system state, constantly stressed, constantly lacking the ability to find peace in any public situation that I didn't have control over. I was drinking a lot. I was chasing women quite a bit to try to like calm me down. And I think also feed my ego at the same time, which is, you know, super counterproductive and, and toxic. I was running away from a lot of things. And I think because I couldn't be still, I couldn't find stillness within myself. And so, you know, I traveled around the world and I did it under the guise of humanitarian aid. And I'm not demonizing myself. I did a lot of cool shit for a lot of good reasons, but there was also this underlying, like, I need to escape. Don't get too close to anybody. They might die. They might betray you. Keep moving forward. Keep being uncomfortable. Don't settle down because if you have to settle down, you have to shut up and listen to your shit and kind of work on it. So I did that for years, man. And I did it <laughs> under the label of like, I'm doing humanitarian aid around the world. Look how cool I am. I'm noble. I'm a, a servant in a different aspect now. But I was really just running and hiding and um, not willing to face those demons, not really to having the internal battle that the external battle had created. There's this quote by Richard Fryman. I think I, I, I apologize if I have the name wrong, but he says, you must not fool yourself, but the problem is you are the easiest person to fool. And as I hear you say that, like I, I can see so many similarities about how I constructed my own life, which is, hey, I'm, I can't sit in stillness because I have too much pain. And therefore, like I will constantly be in motion. I'll travel around the world. I'll do all these cool things. And I'll tell myself that I'm doing all these things for the right reasons. And there's a part of it that's true, but there's also that other driving force that you don't really take a look at until it's it rears its ugly head. And so I'm curious, man, like what was your wake up call to recognizing this thing was real? PTSD was real inside of you. That's a great question, man. I don't know if I had this like epiphany revelation. I think it was just years of like running, years of failed relationships, years of, of alcohol abuse, years of sexual relationships that were toxic or unhealthy or not optimal. And um, probably somewhere in Hawaii. So I got I got out of the Marine Corps. I traveled for like three years. Then I moved to Santa Cruz to work for a nonprofit. And then I got this opportunity to go work back in Hawaii with my first unit or on that base. And I make six figures and live on the beach and like surf every day. I'm like, bro, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Let's go. And I think after I had settled down and I was I was making all the money I needed to make, I was in great shape. I was meeting all these beautiful women. I was surfing, but I had to sit with myself and I'm like, bro, this looks like if you write this down, this looks like the American dream, but are you happy, bro? And I'm like, no. And there's this quote in uh, the Bible that says, if your hope is deferred, your heart is sick. And God, creator, infinite intelligence kind of showed me that. He's like, bro, your hope is deferred. You're doing all these things. 
out of the feeling that you have to be productive or you have to have these accolades or you have to have this resume, but you're not really happy with yourself. And it's because one, I've created you to be an artist and you're not doing that. And two, you're just not in love with yourself. And so that kind of unraveled all of this, like, man, I'm wearing a lot of masks to look cool and to have those phone calls with my friends. And I'm like, yeah, I'm crushing it, man. But really inside I was, I was sick and I was broken and settling down quote unquote in Hawaii to have to start looking in that mirror. That was probably the turning point for me. Yeah, man. Like, you know, I just want to stop for a second just to applaud you on like everything you're saying is just, it's so, uh, so vulnerable and so, you know, revealing. And I love it. I just, I, I love seeing the strength in just being real and saying, Hey, listen, I thought I was being cool, but I was fucking miserable. And, you know, I relate a lot to it. So it feels good to hear someone else going through something that makes me feel not alone. But I've also heard similar stories in countless others as well. And we have these shared experiences and it's just, I don't know, man, just like you said earlier, it's just so important to get this stuff out. And um, I'm sure a lot of the listeners can relate as well. So I just, you know, love you, man. Thank you, brother. That means a lot. I, I've realized in my life, like, uh, there's a Marianne Williamson quote that basically says, our greatest fear is not that we're inadequate. Our greatest fear is that we're powerful beyond measure. It's our light, not our darkness that frightens us most. And then it goes through a few more sentences. But she basically says, once you learn how to shine your light the brightest, and I think that comes with vulnerability, you give everyone else permission to shine around you. You know, And you're playing small does not serve the world. So I think that also correlates to me, like just being super vulnerable. The more I'm vulnerable, the more people show up like you, Keith, and say, dude, yeah, I totally relate to that. I went through that too. And the more I hang out with people that are vulnerable, I'm like, oh, shit, we're all going through this, dude. Cool. I have strength and I have permission to be kind of a mess and be working on my shit. And that's okay. And that's a beautiful thing. And the faster we get to that place, the faster we have people that love and support us and encourage us and then validate everything that we're going through. And then we can build this unity and this team together to go and fix our shit. And then again, encourage other people to do the same thing. That's why the bromance hit off so quickly with the three of us. And, <laughs> you know, it was instant love. I'm like, man, I want this guy in my circle, you know, and I'm grateful <laughs> to have you in here. Feel the same way, man. Uh, I call Big Spoon. <laughs> <laughs> Switching it up on you, Keith. <laughs> Take it. I love everything you're saying, Brandon. And and so, you know, one of the things that you've shared about is how a big part of your healing process is this path through music. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounded like your your path to finding music started with journaling and starting to write at first, and then that eventually turned into music. So can you start to share about maybe like when did the journaling and the writing first started? Has it something that you've been doing since childhood or did that come in Hawaii? When did that happen? And then when did the music, when did that manifest into music? Yeah, yeah, great question. I believe that I started journaling when I became this like religious zealot, <laughs> this <laughs> Pharisee of sorts, where I was like reading the Bible every day and then I'd kind of journal my thoughts and that kind of activated it. By the way, Brandon, how, how annoying were you? Like how annoying were you of a religious <laughs> zealot? We just need to kind of calibrate that. Yeah, give a contact. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Great question, man. So yeah, I read my Bible every day. Like oh, if, yeah. if people started talking about like pornography, I would like walk away. I'd be like, I'm going to pray for you guys. And I'd walk <laughs> away and read my fucking Bible and like, like pretend I was holier than thou. And like, oh, yeah. uh, I think it came from a good place, bro. I think I was really trying to connect with like the source. And, uh, but I just, it was ugly. It was religious. It was very like, uh, if it wasn't God, it was Satan. And so this duality, which I think ruins everything. And then if it, you know, didn't align with Christian doctrine, it was, it was satanic or it was, uh, you know, blasphemy and just like, just ignorant bullshit uh, to the point, you know, people would mess with me too. And like, I can look back and laugh so hard, but people would like throw porno in my my face and they would like <laughs> show me, show me naked women. And I'm like, Hey bro, you know, come on, man, respect me, dude. Like, <laughs> but they were giving me a hard time. And yeah. again, talk about like building strength, you know, trying not to go masturbate after someone throws a, a playboy in your face. It's like a little challenging, <laughs> but uh, it was all, it was all good, man. And, and uh, I've come a long way. And psychedelics really broke that open for me about like seeing God in such a bigger light than just the Christian doctrine. And if it works for you, cool. At the end of the day, like, I'm like, I don't care what you believe. I care about the fruit of your life. Is your life full of love and sacrifice and good relationships? Then cool. If you believe aliens put us here, awesome. That works. Is your life full of love? Then that's all I really care about. 
Very cool, man. And so I know I got you off track uh, about your journaling. Uh, so, so yeah, just to bring you back on track around the journaling part of it and the writing, where, like, where, where did that come to be in your life? Yeah. So I think that started when I started a daily practice of reading the Bible and I still read every day. And then it prompts me to want to journal. I've experimented with different areas. Like sometimes you've heard of the artist's way, I think is it's yeah. just like three pages, 10 minutes of free flow in the morning. I think like uh, Ed Sheeran said it best. He's like, dude, your brain is like a tap. Sometimes you got to turn that on. You got to get the old water, the, the stale water out of the tap to get some new fresh ideas in there. And so it's just a great place to decompress. It's a great place to look at what you're thinking. I think that's a great reflection Mm -hmm. that you can't always get when it's internal. And then um, it just prompted me to be poetic. You know, I started writing songs around 16 years old, but I never took it seriously. And once I started journaling, then I would go pick up a guitar. And like a lot of times, like in in Iraq and Afghanistan, I'd go down to the chapel in between combat operations. And I would just pick up a guitar and I just start like free flowing. And a lot of those things I'd probably written and reread started coming out as lyrics. And so it's all kind of connected. But yeah, I encourage everyone to have some type of journal practice. I think it's really nice to, one, get those thoughts out of your head and get them on paper. Two, to kind of reflect in a way that you can't really reflect without like reading it and like absorbing it from a perspective of of a receivership, from an outside perspective. And then three, I think a lot of times you start manifesting things in your life. When you put it on paper, you start actualizing things things in your life that you need, that you want to come into fruition. And so it's just a powerful, powerful habit that's given me a lot of clarity and a lot of inspiration for my music making. Beautiful. I'm on day 70 actually right now of The Artist's Way. Amazing. So, in that incredible time, so I basically have two weeks left and I know exactly what you're talking about. I think what you just said, and I wrote this down, because I've never heard it put this way, and I think it's pretty beautiful. Journaling is a great way to look at what you're thinking. Very simple. And you know, like one of the analogies that... Laura Cameron, Linda Cameron, or whoever the author is of the book, she says that it's like these morning pages is like a dust buster for your brain because you're just thinking nice. the same garbage thoughts over and over again. They clutter all the other creativity, new thoughts, new awarenesses to come through. So when I wake up in the morning and I get all that garbage out on paper, after a page and a half, the garbage is gone and then new stuff starts to come in. Yeah. And so as as you started to find that this journaling was a way for you to start to tap into some of these deeper feelings and emotions that you had and you turned it into music, what did that start to do for you? Was there any resistance between, you know, the journaling part and then turning it into a song and then releasing it into the world or were like you were you kind of fearless in the hey, I've got something to say and I want to I want to put it out there. Dude, the hardest thing I've ever done is be an artist. <laughs> like I think sometimes I'd rather go back to scout, scout sniper school or reconnaissance training than like release music wow. that talks about, you know, my vulnerabilities. It's challenging. What gives me hope is obviously when I get messages that are like, you've totally transformed my life or you've, you know, put things into a beautiful new perspective for me. So yeah. How did it turn into music? I don't know, man. That's a really great question. I've always been an artist and no one in my family is an artist. I don't know where this came from. It could be, you know, my grandfather, my great grandfather. I have no, no clue. I started playing saxophone in fourth grade. And the moment I started playing, I would go down into my basement and play for two hours. Nobody had to ask me. I became this like incredible saxophone player. I was playing in a high school band in fourth grade. I got into, you know, a, a rock and roll band in high school. And then once I picked up the guitar and I started singing, I was like, dude, this is it. There's something on my voice. There's something that transcends. It's the most flow state I can possibly be. It's the most vulnerable, real present I can possibly be is in music, especially when I'm singing. And so for whatever reason, whether that's a gift or something I cultivated, probably a little bit of both, it just made sense. It gives me the most amount of joy and it, it's the most transformative thing I think I can serve to humanity. I mean, who doesn't love a good song, especially a love song you can make love to, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Speaking as someone who's had never had any musical talent and Keith can probably, he yeah. has none either. Like I've always wanted to know when you're courting a woman and then she finds out that you're a musician, then you sit her down, you bring the guitar out and you sing her one of your love songs or whatever song. Is it over at that point? Is there anything else that needs to be done? And what does that feel like? Yeah, that's funny, dude. Yeah, it's so funny because I think part of me started playing guitar when I was 16 so I could get those opportunities and I could get laid. I wanted that attention. And now that I'm older, like I don't break that out for anybody because I don't want it to be misconstrued. It's like, this guy's just doing this to get laid because I was like, yeah, I probably did that. That's a great question. So the few really beautiful, healthy relationships I've been in 
when I'm like playing guitar on the couch while she's getting her hair done so we can go on a date and she comes out of the bathroom and says, Brandon, that's so beautiful. I'm like, 100%, this is worth it. And two, definitely getting late tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, this thing I have was a uh, motorcycle. Bust that out on date three. Deal nice. sealer every time. Interesting. But that's what these guys with uh, no musical talent have to do. You know what I, mean? <laughs> <laughs> I got to figure out like what my thing is, man. You got a guitar, you got a mo- motorcycle. Is there is there anything else that's out there that I, I can, I don't need a talent or a skill. I can just mm. buy like a motorcycle. <laughs> <Just buy> <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> oh, let me think about that. I'm going to figure this out. That's a great <laughs> question. Something. Please yeah, do. Sure. One of the cool things that we're going to end this episode with is you've graciously offered to share one of your songs with us that... I personally love, and it's now on my workout playlist and it's your don't mistake song. Badass, dude. Yeah, I see you you fist pumping in the air. So tell us a little bit about this song. And first of all, what are we going to hear? Because we're going to end the episode with the song. What are we going to hear? And then what are the origins of that song? Yeah, so good, man. So yeah, this is a song called Don't Mistake, which this is amazing that you picked this song, Dominic, because this ties in perfectly with everything we've just been talking about. I wrote this as an anthem to myself to present to the rest of the world. I'm like, all right, I'm going from this fucking badass alpha male recon scout sniper, Iraq, Afghanistan, war combat veteran to this guy who's now going to pick up a guitar and like be vulnerable, play love songs, try to transform your consciousness through conscious music. And I was struggling with that. And I still, to this day, sometimes struggle with it. It's gotten a lot less of a, of a pull, but I was writing this to myself, like, dude, don't mistake the fact that I'm nice and kind and vulnerable and creating this beautiful art for a form of weakness. This doesn't make me weak. Vulnerability is actually strength. And I had to write this for myself to be like, bro, you got this. You're, you're not weak because you're vulnerable. You're not weak because you choose love over hate. You're not weak because you want peace instead of chaos. Um, and then it transformed into this, like, all my combat, everything I've been through, the confusion of all that, did it make me more of a man? Yes. Did it make me somewhat of a toxic human? Yes. Can I find love and forgiveness for that? Absolutely. And to a place where now the men that I'm hanging out with are vulnerable and we're using our intellect and we're using our vulnerability and we're using our kindness to heal humanity instead of to destroy and coming to terms with it. And maybe you can link the video in it too, because it is my journey with plant medicine and uh, coming to terms with the forgiveness of my enemies, forgiveness with myself, forgiveness with the chaos that is the human experience and finding and choosing love in that place and inviting everyone else who's going through the challenges to maybe seek mother nature medicine, go seek psychedelics, go seek those great healers that can transform And that can allow you to know that just because you're choosing love and kindness doesn't make you weak. It makes you actually stronger. Yeah, dude, that was that song around the bonfire. You know, it was moving, man. Really, really beautiful. I loved it. And I'm I'm glad I know the name of it now because I want to go look it up on Spotify. It's so great. It's got to go on my playlist as well. Thank you guys so much, man. It means a lot. And I think it's brilliant, Brandon, that you wrote that to yourself as kind of like a, I can be this and that, right? I, like I, I can be this strong man and I can also be sensitive. I can be the guy who goes to the front lines and I can also be on the front lines of human consciousness and vulnerability where for so many years of your life, it was an either or. And what I hear in that song is like this beautiful integration. You know what I mean? And for the first time in your life, and it was kind of like this, It was almost like you gave yourself the invitation to step into this new you. Uh, Mm. And so that's what I hear every time I listen to that song. That's beautiful, man. Thank you for that. It's definitely a a permission giving song, you know, for people to step into their fullness. All right. So to our listeners, please stick around to hear the Don't Mistake song uh, by Brandon Mills. And I want to let you all know that Brandon's links are all in the show notes. So I'm going to be linking two songs on Spotify, Don't Mistake, which you're going to love, and it's going to end up on your workout playlist. And also his love song called Glistening, which he and Keith will be spooning to after this show is over. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I'm going to be linking Brandon's website with the video that I referenced. It's a great three and a half minute story of Brandon's life and an overview of where he's been and you know why he writes the music that he does. And I'm also going to be linking his Instagram account so you can stay, you know, fresh, up to date with where he is and the music he's putting out. And Brandon, is there anything else you want to offer with respect to how people can get close to your music? Yeah. Uh, first and foremost, so much gratitude for you, Dom. So much gratitude for you, Keith. 
you guys have inspired me. I'm so glad we're connected. So what I like to do, my bread and butter is to do house show tours. And so October, November, I'm starting to set up house show tours. So basically, if you want to host me, if you feel moved by my music, by my message, you want to have this intimate evening in your home or in your barn uh, at a winery near your house, let me know. Uh, hit me up. I've got uh, something I can send you. But we, I like to do this whole grassroots movement where we get rid of the bouncer, we get rid of the bartenders, we make it a really intimate, honest, open, vulnerable, authentic experience. And I'd love to meet some of your guys in the tribe and uh, make that happen. So let me know if you guys are interested. That's amazing, man. We got to make that happen at some point. So let's talk about it. Awesome. Thanks, Brandon, for being on the show, man. Love you, bud. Thank you guys so much, dude. Big love. And without further ado, here is Don't Mistake by Brandon Mills. Don't mistake my kindness for weakness. I choose love, but you will never beat this. Don't mistake my kindness for weakness. Just because I speak peace, you'll never defeat this. No. I've been through two foreign wars. Seen innocent bloodshed on the pavement, still don't know what for. It seems like greed can corrupt a whole country. We got to give access to the people who have less. Strong arms, weak souls. Shallow men always fighting for control. The governments pretend to represent. It's farther from the truth with every lie that they present. Don't mistake my kindness for weakness. I choose love, but you will never beat this. Don't mistake my kindness for weakness. Just because I speak peace. You'll never defeat this goal Letting go no longer, keep it score Learning how to serve love from the deepest of my core Warriors uniting around the world The demons flee when I and we, we walk along in harmony Strong hearts, bold souls than the ghost Noble men connect to represent Fall divided, stand united Evolve when we respect Maybe it's you as the us Or maybe it's us versus them Or maybe it's me first myself A battle like fight from within Screaming up God bless myself And God bless America God bless my soul And God bless America Hi, I'm this right here is my declaration Reparations and separations It took some time for that preparation Sitting here, oh God bless my soul Have I pledged allegiance to my own allegiance No man down, only stand down Better stand for Luke, cause I'm a man now Let's go Feed this no. 